Hey everyone, welcome to the very first episode of Punch Card Investing. So happy to be with my buddies here, Brad Kellner, Karan Granani, and Tom Bodica of Investing with Tom. We are missing one member, Investing with Frank, who's got daddy daycare, um, what does he say, daddy daycare duties. So uh, <laughs> he'll be with us in future weeks, so don't you worry about that. Uh, and then my name is Jack Duffley. We all have our own YouTube channels. If you're not familiar with all of us, I'll always include links to that in the description below. And before we kick off, I will make a pitch to our Discord, which I'll always include in, in the description below as well if you want to continue the conversation outside of this. But we want this to be a pretty casual kind of way to chat about investing ideas, the world of value investing, our own investment portfolios, what we're doing there, things we're thinking about, things we've seen recently, and also give you guys a chance to ask us questions if you want to know our perspective on something or maybe you heard about something cool and just want to hear our thoughts about it. We'd love to get a conversation going there too. Uh, but every episode we're planning on having some sort of pre-designated topic for maybe the first half or so and then see where the conversation goes. Uh, so for this week, the topic that we're doing is the very Charlie Munger inspired, what is your best investment idea right now? That doesn't mean it's going to be a good idea, but the best <laughs> relative to everything else is kind of what we're going for here. So um, I guess just so I can stop talking for a second, I'll, I'll pass it off to whoever wants to volunteer first to give us your best investment idea. Right I think that people can include it in the comments, you know, if they want to mention their best investment idea too. Mm, that'd be great. Yeah. Why don't you start, Karan, and then, uh, oh. yeah, like Karan yeah. said, everyone, if you got if you got a suggestion, um, what do you think your best in the idea is? Definitely put it in the chat. Yeah, so, um, I mean, my best investment idea is Pershing Square, at least for this year. So you've got uh, one of the best sort of value investors out there. And, um, yeah, I think he's, like, in his, he's, like, getting to his prime. And right now his fund trades at a discount to the net asset value. So it seems like a great opportunity to me. I'll go ahead and piggyback off that because that was what I was going to say too, Pershing Square Holdings. I know Karan <laughs> and I did a collaboration on it recently because yeah. we both own it in our portfolio. That's the fund run by Bill Ackman. Um, has a number of holdings in there, so maybe it's kind of a cop-out answer in that it's a fund, not really a, a, a one particular stock. One thing I definitely like about it is the downside protection uh, in that Pershing Square holds a lot of uh, credit default swaps. So if the debt market were to fall in some way, they theoretically would benefit there. And that covers some of the downside. And in this expensive market, I kind of like some extra downside protection. So I'd probably concur with you there, Karan. But uh, let's see what, what's Brad got. What, what's well, your hold on. I have, I have a follow-up question Go on, for it. Uh, on Pershing sure. Square. So um, those credit default swaps, do you know how long those are those are good for? Like how long is he contractually obligated to pay the premiums on those? Do you guys know the details about that? Uh, Karan might know the expiration dates. I don't know how long they actually last, but I do know it's a lot smaller relative to uh, what it's he had. 1% back. Yeah. of his total assets, but I'm yeah. not sure until when is he obligated to keep paying the premiums. Right. Okay. Know that. Yeah. I want to say it's a, it's kind of spread out. I'm not too sure though. This is kind of a guess. Um, I'm not sure when exactly they expire though. But compared to the one he had back in March 2020, uh, when uh, if you saw the the hell is coming clip where uh, sure uh, he came out of the markets, he had a much larger hedge at that point. Yeah, and was in the middle of cashing out of that when he, when he made that TV appearance that went down in infamy um for right. whether there was truly what he was trying to do or not it mm -hmm. doesn't seem like it but it definitely looked really bad um but we like uh, Kron and i like bill ackman enough anyways beyond that any bad press uh, so one more follow-up would you guys be buying at today's prices i know it's done really well over the last year what are you thinking about it at current prices yes i would buy more it's still at like a 30 percent discount to net asset value and if you actually include the forward purchase agreements it's more like 40 to 50 percent so potentially okay. more so you've got like a pretty huge margin of safety um, yeah the yeah. the warrants for purging square tontine holdings uh, make it much more attractive um the, my only hesitation at today's prices is that yes there's a discount to nav but uh the actual assets in the portfolio are pretty expensive in some right. cases. Um, like Starbucks has had a huge run up and they're going through some tough times right now. And you'd hope to get a bigger discount there. Uh, but that's just 
that's just one concern. I don't know if I'd buy it at today's price. I already have a pretty significant holding relative to the rest of my portfolio. And I don't want to be too overweight in it uh, when I'm trying to go for some other opportunities, like in a real estate deal or something like that. I want to stay pretty liquid. Sure. Cool. For me, it's my largest holding. So. Yeah. I think yeah. it's my second largest behind uh, <clears throat> on a, Commonwealth. On a cost basis or just, just currently? Um, I currently. Think I think it's yeah. second for me currently. And also, I think it's the same on a cost basis because equity commonwealth went up a little bit uh, and Pershing Square Holdings for me has been pretty flat. Uh, but yeah, I haven't equity commonwealth is actually my second best idea in yeah, terms of that. asset protection. Well, we're just going like, to list our whole portfolio. <laughs> the same here, people yeah. here, Karan and I. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> well, what do you got, Brad? What's your what's your best investment idea right now? Well, you know, I uh, you guys know I bought Alibaba recently, but we're, let's let's push that one aside. Because I already pulled the trigger. Um, so Topicus.com is looking somewhat interesting to me. So that's a recent spin from Constellation Software. Um, and they're, they're really targeting the European market. Um, so the idea of buying Constellation Software 10 years ago or so is, is fairly exciting to me. It's a company owned by Chris Meyer, author of 100 Baggers. And yeah, so I've just been digging in recently, but I'm I'm intrigued by Topicus. Have you guys looked at that at all? What is it? I've never heard of it. What are, what what I'm do looking, they do, Brad? I'm looking uh, right vertical now. vertical market software and platforms in Europe. So it's it's basically like a mini constellation software. Out of uh, it's a Canadian kind of long term compounder. Uh, they they own a bunch of different businesses in the software space. What are their what are some of the ratios like? I mean, in terms of return on capital and stuff. Um, let's see. I can pull that up. Tom, do you want to share yours while I yeah, pull sure. that stuff up? Here, I can actually. Uh, uh, I, can, I, I can put up Topicus right here, and there we go. So cool. Here's their Ooh, company site. Nice. Um. About us. What do we got here, Topicus? Vertical market software. I'm trying to understand what that means, Brad. <laughs> yeah, what is that? It's sexy, <laughs> though, isn't it? <laughs> so, TSS Public, TSS Blue, and Topicus. So that's the three companies within it. So it's a holding company for those three. Um, right. So this, this write-up uh, refers to it as a sequel to the Constellation software story, essentially. What's the Constellation software yes. story? You guys aren't familiar with no. Constellation software. No. No, you're going to have to pretend we're five-year-olds here, Brad, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you get, uh, why don't you go, Tom? I'm going to gather my, my thoughts around this here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I thought I'd stir the pot a little bit because this is a um, this is a stock that uh, I know Brad at least you've owned in the past, and I think you may have taken a loss on this one. Um, oh. And it's a it's a stock that's still in my portfolio, uh, and it's actually Graphtech is a oh. is a company that I'm going to put out there. So, um, yeah, I guess for anyone that doesn't know the story of GraphTech, basically this was a Monash Pabrai clone from late 2019, I think it was. Uh, essentially this this company sells graphite electrodes to steel companies and the, the thesis at the time was basically they have locked in contracts for their revenue, they're vertically integrated, so they have uh, known costs to produce these graphite electrodes. And with the price at the time, essentially you were getting, you were very likely to get your Basically, they were going to earn essentially their market cap over the next sort of four to five years. So uh, it's a stock I still own. Um, when Jack said, give us your best, best investment idea, I sort of said I don't have any <laughs> at the moment, but, <laughs> but I'll give you a mediocre one. Um, and this is a stock I'm still holding. So, I mean, I think a couple of things have changed since that Pabrai investment. I mean, Pabrai actually sold out altogether. And probably the main reason for that in in my opinion at least, is because of the long-term long contracts kind of not being as solid as maybe you first thought. So they had some some bankruptcies in their customer base, particularly when the pandemic first started. Um, 
some of those contracts mm. were, were renegotiated, but there's also some really good things happening. So Brookfield Asset Management previously owned, I think close to like 80% of the company. So there was quite a significant risk in a lot of shareholders' minds that Brookfield would basically kind of buy out all the rest of the shares at you know very undervalued prices and kind of rip off shareholders, which they actually have kind of been accused of doing that in the past. So that risk is is a lot lower now. They only own about 37% of the company today. Um, they were also very highly leveraged back in 2019 and they've they've still got some debt in the business, but it's much more attractive now. They've rolled it out to maturities in 2025 and 2028 at much lower interest rates, like in the 4% interest rate kind of zone. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to pull it up um jack but if you just do a quick google search on um like a global steel price index you'll also notice that commodity prices for steel are extremely high at the moment so um graphtech still sells about 30 percent of their volume on the spot market and the um the graphite electrodes are generally on a bit of a lag to what the steel market's doing um, because the steel companies sort of produce steel, use all the graphite electrodes up and then have to buy some more and kind of replace those. So we've probably seen about a six month lag in terms of that actually flowing through to Graftech, but that spot price uh, sort of volume that they sell is probably going to get priced pretty highly coming up here soon as well. So uh, that's my pitch. The, the price is essentially the same as back in 2019 when Pabri bought it, but I think um, some really good things have, have changed. So uh that's my idea feel free to to tear it apart as you wish <laughs> how does the future look for graph tech i mean do they have more contracts coming in or? yeah yeah that's kind of the million dollar question so um i guess pabri first went into it as this sort of being like a, a low risk high uncertainty kind of bet that that he's made a lot in the past so we're basically going to earn a lot of money up front and that we're going to get most of our money back but after those four or five years we really don't know what's going to happen um and in a lot of ways that's still the case i guess the advantage that graphtech has is they're vertically integrated and they have known costs and they're the low cost producer of graphite electrodes so they they own a subsidiary called sea drift um which produce petroleum needle coke which is um essential for producing graphite electrodes um so they're the low cost producer but they still really haven't negotiated any long-term contracts beyond, I think, 2024. So that's something that we'll probably find out uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, fingers crossed if, if steel prices continue to go up, they can take advantage of that. But that's kind of, that's probably the biggest unknown and still the biggest risk in, in graph tech. Um, so yeah, maybe that's maybe we should at. ask Brad why he sold out. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be a good... Uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah. bear uh, focus <clears throat> um, yeah well I mean the main reason I sold out is because it, it was unclear that those contracts were going to be upheld right and so mm -hmm. you know the downside potential the downside story changed and um, you know partly it was Pabri getting out I mean Pabri was a big reason I, I kind of dipped into that one and um, you know, with the story changing, changing the risk profile on the downside, just decided, you know, time to cut, cut my losses and look for something more compelling. Yeah. And I don't, I don't have any yeah, regrets one, about it, but. <clears throat> yeah. 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 One, one number I'll just put out there on valuation, I guess, because the, the initial thesis was we're going to earn the market cap in the next few years. So, you know, right. what's that situation look like at the moment? So. Um, by my estimates, um, I've got Graftech earning probably about $700 million a year in free cash flow for the next two years, so about $1.4 billion over the next two years. Um, the current market cap is about $3 billion or a fraction over $3 billion, so we're probably going to get half of the market cap back in the next two years. Um, and then what happens after that, again, is, is still unknown, but I think there's some Good tailwinds. The other thing I was actually going to mention is um, keeping it with the Pabri theme is is the the free lottery tickets. So I guess um, one of those free lottery tickets potentially is is commodity prices just being high right now. But one of the other tailwinds that um, has been spoken about a little bit. I don't really I don't know how real it is, but um, 
some of the same components that go into making graphite electrodes also go into making batteries for electric vehicles. And there's obviously going to be massive demand for some of those materials moving forward. So whether the graph tech gets some benefit from that um, is, is, you know, potentially built into the situation as well. It's not a reason that I would put money in there in the first place, but it's something you potentially get for free kind of uh, in that business as well. One of my best uh, performing uh, trades in the last year is actually I put I put a little bit of money into copper miners as kind of like a inflation hedge, and it turned into an EV play just because of the craze, and it's up like <laughs> almost a hundred percent in like six months. So that could be that. That's actually a good observation. <clears throat> um, like seeing where the EV industry goes, so you don't even have to pick a winner there as long as EVs themselves take over. That that could be a nice little extra bonus yep. there. But yeah, not 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 yeah. really a reason to invest in it in itself, though. Yeah, just um, sorry, I'll I'll mention one more thing about graph tech, then we can move on if you like. But um, uh, yeah, maybe since you're doing all the screen sharing and you know how this works, Jack, if you just um, search Graphite India stock, um, this is a business that um, admittedly I haven't done as much of a deep dive on as graph tech, but um this is a business that's up like 260 percent since october last year something crazy and this company is much more exposed to the spot market for graphite electrodes um, which one is that graphite what? graphite india oh india um if you search graphite india stock it should come up but that's an example of a, a business that's a bit more exposed to just commodity price movements Sagar whereas that up, um, right? during the podcast also he did he did yeah so yeah, I'm not sure if you can do the percentages there, but it's up pretty big since That's October it. last year. And yeah, Graphtech's <laughs> seen a little bit of that, but not as not as much. Yeah, about two x. Yeah, so that's Alrighty. my pitch. <clears throat> All right. Hey Jack, can you pull up my uh, my Twitter feed? There's a, an image I posted relating to metals and mining that I think might be interesting for people. Sure thing. Give me a moment. But let's uh, let's talk more about um, the not constellation. What is going on there, Brad? <laughs> Which one? The uh, with topic uh, topic yeah. topic You know, you guys, I'm realizing I'm realizing I don't have uh, a firm understanding of the business yet. I didn't realize I was going to be asked follow up questions. <laughs> Uh, you just want to know what it is, Brad. <laughs> you just want to know what it is. Yeah. So you don't own this one yet, Brad. It's just sort of something you're looking at at the moment. It's something that came across my radar today. Because I right. think I was in your position, Tom, where I was like, yeah, there's nothing I'm, I'm really excited to buy at the moment. So I decided, like to hustle. I decided to hustle a little, a little bit for you guys and come up with something. But Here, here is... Uh, yeah, so are there some big investors in it? Or... Um, not, not really. No, no, uh, no gurus that I'm, that I'm aware of. Any small little fund managers? It's, it's really just uh, an idea from Chris Meyer. Um, he disclosed six of his 11 positions in his last mm. blog post. Um, so I, I dug into those six and it's the one that looked most interesting. And then um, Brad, here's your, uh, here's your medals. Yeah. Can you click on that image there? So this is really interesting, interesting to me. One of the uh, funds that I follow, it's a really small fund, massive capital. Uh, half of their portfolio is mining companies. Um, so this, this was really interesting in terms of, you know, what demand might look like, uh, not just for electric vehicles, but, you know, all of these kind of new technology areas. And it's a little hard to see autonomous and electric vehicles, advanced robotics, renewable, including wind and solar. Um, so there, there's a lot coming down the pike here. And there's a pretty vast shortage in a lot of these materials for what we're going to need to really transition into these um, into maturity in these industries. So uh, I, I found a tin company. I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but a tin miner in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So obviously some some geopolitical risk there, but could be interesting. You know, no, no, Brad, I know you talked about um, kind of this sustainable sort of 
right. focus you have on, on your investing. You don't want to invest in highly unsustainable industries. Um, yeah. Mining is arguably not sustainable and there's often a lot of pollutants that go into it. Is that a consideration you're making here or, or is the <clears throat> opportunity simply too, too big to ignore? It's not that the opportunity is too big to ignore. This is something I'm, I'm still kind of wrestling with. Uh, in order to make this transition, the fact is we're going to need the raw materials in order to actually do it. So even though mining is traditionally thought of as a kind of a dirty industry, um, I think you need to look at it from a, a whole, you know, a 50,000 foot view. Um, so that, that's, that's what I'm trying to do here. And I think Massif does a really good job of doing that. Every quarter they put out a letter to their investors and kind of talk through this stuff. So uh, I've drank, I've drank the Kool-Aid from them. Yeah. I mean, like with the, the whole sustainable movement in general, like electric cars, pretty much everything, there's large input costs up front and you're going to need Absolutely. Those materials in some way. So it's like, well, if you're going to need the materials anyways, you might as well profit on that upswing. And then once those materials are mined, then you can make the sustainable thing. So it's kind of a, it's a trade-off, but uh, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I think as batteries improve, like they're obviously going to get smaller, more dense. Right. So you're going to need less metals. Overall. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, SC said, I need to read Will's uranium take. So Will is the, uh, the guy who writes the letters and makes the primary investor for massive capital. Uh, he does own some uranium miners. Um, so he's, he's bullish actually on nuclear, which is, I'm not quite there yet. I, I have uh, pretty mixed feelings. I'd say I'm net negative on <laughs> nuclear at the moment, but it's possible that I'll change my mind on that. I just don't have enough trust in humanity or the people who are operating these nuclear plants to be able to do it safely. Uh, that's, that's my big issue. I think Phil, Phil Town may have hinted on one of his podcasts that he's um, fairly bullish on nuclear energy as well. I'm not sure if anyone heard that. Mm, did I miss that one? No, what are you I know there's been okay, a lot yeah, of money. He, he, uh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, he was basically talking about, I forget the specific company, but it was on the Invested podcast maybe two, three weeks ago, something like that. And he was talking about a um, an electricity or an energy company that was talking through some of the government's you know targets for um, how much renewable energy they want to use or, or how much they want to get away from um, oil and gas to produce electricity right. and the high level numbers said that it was pretty obvious it was impossible without something like nuclear or some other yeah. energy source there's been a pretty large inflow in, into uranium miners and just uranium in general in, in the mm -hmm. last like six months as, as I mean as you can see by the uh, global uh, global uranium ETF. Um, hmm. There's been actually some pretty big inflows into it pretty recently, and I think because of that thesis, Tom, um, that it, as part of a green initiative or just in general, it just it's kind of hard to ignore. Then, of course, with all commodities, you have the overarching concern with all the monetary policy, just, just the hedge in, against inflation. Um, I think commodities so, were just great as an investment in March. Until now, it's been pretty good. Funny and who or into mining commodities. Companies. Yeah, any commodity. It, it, it's more like uh, anything that's not the dollar has been great or whatever currency <laughs> has been has been pretty great. Mm. So yeah. that, and that tends Jack, to be commodities. Jack, are you able to easily pull up what the components are of this ETF? I'm just curious what the what the biggest components are. Sure. Um, yeah, let, let me look mm. at that. Um, it's it just about any stock's been a good investment in the last few months, though, isn't it? Yeah. Not just commodities. <laughs> That's also true. Yeah, true. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> I think we've all done decently well, yeah, last year. Yeah. Um, so Jesse points out the, the Ackman credit swap. I guess five years is the typical credit default swap duration. I'm pretty sure that's what it was with his original one. Incredible. I mean, it paid off, what, in the first month, right? This five-year bet, um, pretty impressive what Ackman was able to do with that. Yeah, and it, it basically co it covered the entire loss. It was, I don't want to call it a perfect hedge, but it was like, uh, it, it wasn't like a totally bearish or totally bullish type of move in that like 
uh, it just negated all of the downflow or uh, it negated all of the losses to where then yeah. you could reinvest it into all the stocks that went down, put a lot in the Howard Hughes, Starbucks, and pretty much his whole portfolio. But yep. um, uh, it, it worked really well there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like he said it was like someone just gave him like a gift of like 2.7 billion. Right at the kind of was like that. <laughs> right at so, the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, um, Jesse also mentions Bill Gates. So I know Gates is also pretty bullish on nuclear energy. He's been uh-huh. investing quite a bit. In it, yeah. I'm looking for yeah, Have you guys seen that three part Netflix documentary on him? Not yet. Mm-hmm. Oh, here we go. I finally found the top holdings of the uranium ETF. So here we go. Um, have you watched it, Tom? The documentary? Yeah, it's really good. Uh, yeah, it, it is good. Um, and he does talk quite a bit about nuclear in, I think it gets maybe even one entire episode or half an episode in that three-part series. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in Bill Gates' thoughts on that, that would be a good place to go. He's doing it in China, isn't he? That's where he's developing it. Uh, I think that's correct, yeah, because he, um, forgetting, I'm, um, I'm struggling on the details, but there was something where that was he was pretty low on options where he could, you know, do the kind of experiments and trials that he was wanting to do, I think was the gist of it. Yeah. It's interesting to see here that there aren't many big players in the uranium space. No. Uh, Kaz Adam prom is the one I'm, I'm familiar with, but. And that's, you know. I mean, that's the whole biggest ones at quarter yeah. of the fund. So, yep. um, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with any uranium miners in sure. particular. So, um, and I wonder if any of these have like multiple, smaller companies within them um but that's so that that's what the ctf is um and i'm sure there there's other others as well but it is kind of a nit, it's a pretty niche space um because mm. of so many countries hesitation to get into it i imagine there's a lot of regulatory hurdles right yeah right yeah. this is pretty concentrated isn't it it is yeah, yeah that those that's, that's that's nice yeah those market values aren't in thousands or anything that's like the biggest mark Oh, hang on. So that that's market value of their holding. What's the actual market cap of some of those businesses? I don't know. Let's take a look. Is that? <clears throat> yeah, it's there on the last column. One oh, point. That's that's that that's the ETF holding, isn't right. it? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the. Market that's what price. I. Yeah. Might right. be wrong there, but. Um, yeah. LA stock. <sighs> yeah. I'm I'm right. wondering if there's a bunch of small caps that are just exploding from some ETF flow or something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it could it could be. Um, I, oh, I, would, 7 billion. I would totally guess that seven billion on the on the largest holding. So, I mean, that's yeah. it's kind of hard to move the ticker on that. Um, yeah, impossible by any means. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've got ETFs like growing up small companies all over the place. <laughs> Arc. Arc. <laughs> <laughs> they're blowing up like on Arc. <laughs> they're blowing up almost trillion dollar companies, aren't they? Yeah, really. Um, yeah, I, I really wonder how much of the like the Tesla run up has been thanks to Arc. I'm sh- it's not all of it, obviously, but I wonder how much. Like, what portion is from Arc Flow? Because it, it's such a huge portion of. of uh, They're selling like, out of Arc right now. I think so. They're buying into Coinbase, yeah. <laughs> that too. Um, yeah. What what did, what did Coinbase actually? What are they valued at now? Um, Situation. I think 85 billion or so. Did it, did it get over 100 at any point? I think it did, right? I think I, like it went up for a bit and then just crashed. I see 45 billion. In Coinbase? Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I just pulled up uh, the, the Google page for it and it says 67 billion. Um, so I don't know if that counts market after hours, which it hasn't moved much. Um, anyways, mm. a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot. It's. It's crazy some of the numbers that are getting slapped on these things. Um, I won't mention the company, but there's a there's a company that went public here in New Zealand that is um, works almost in the same office building as I do, and um, they they've got zero revenue and they've a tiny company and they've got like a hundred million dollar market cap or something crazy. Like there's some some they might grow into that. I don't know, but there's some crazy <laughs> things going anything. on. And it might grow into a yeah. hundred trillion dollar yeah. company. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, I'm trying to stop the amount of times I, I bag on Tesla's valuation because I just keep looking dumber and dumber over these I, last couple I, of years. I I, uh, I talked about it. I, don't know if, I think I talked about it in a video. I've definitely talked about it in a bunch of comments. Uh, you could easily see Tesla pulling a Microsoft. Um, 
right? Like, as, as in like Microsoft in the, in the early 2000s. Zero returns over 20 years. Yeah, it was like 15 years, but like, because um, they hit such a ludicrous valuation as many tech stocks did in, at 2000. Um, I could actually just pull up their chart, um, Microsoft mm. stock. But basically they went sideways or slightly downwards mm -hmm. until about 2016. So you didn't get any return through that whole period if you held Microsoft. Meanwhile, the company was still building its profits and it was a great business. It was just it just got to such a crazy valuation that it wasn't worth it anymore. Um, mm. But obviously now in the last few years, it's taken off. But yeah, if we go to 2000 to... Yeah, but interest rates are also way different. I mean, if you're that, comparing interest true. rates then versus now, you can justify, you know, a lot higher valuation. So... So here's yeah, Microsoft. I mean, <laughs> it peaked around here, but like, look, you didn't. You were flat all the way to 2016, um, and obviously now, if you've held since then, you're not. It's not so bad. Um, this doesn't factor in dividends and everything like that. But um, basically, flat for six, 15 years in a great company. So great companies can have yeah. bad stocks. Yeah, I saw a, I saw a tweet the other day that said, um, uh, "How'd it go?" It said uh, it was it was referencing the tech bubble, and it said. Um, Tech bears always use Microsoft as an example, and tech bulls always use Amazon as an example. Like, have you <laughs> bought it in two thousand? <laughs> Which is interesting. I mean, I use Microsoft a lot, and it's just um, it's one of those things. Like, I'm trying to trying to keep more of an open mind, even though some of these things have seemed crazy ten x ago. You know. Well, the the thing is, it's like um, so mu so much of like investing is, is like just pure emotion for so many people. Uh, we've I th we've all talked about it the first time i actually heard about it was on your channel tom with, with uh the magellan fund under peter lynch uh is amazing oh, yeah. amazing yeah. 30 percent per year returns for like 10 something years or 10 or 12 years i forget how long so if you just parked your money in there and didn't do anything it'd be great if the average investor in the fund lost money which is crazy so because hmm. people aren't yeah. doing a fundamental analysis in the short term in many cases and and then they they hurt themselves even when all they have to do is hold and, and not think about it too much. Um, but people just, they don't look at valuations and they're, they're not careful with, with things like that. Yeah. And, and Frank, <clears throat> uh, sorry, you got Karan. Yeah, even in terms of Microsoft, I mean, I think Steve Ballmer, he's like the largest shareholder, right? And he's been holding on ever since the big day. The person who was the CEO uh, right after mm. Gates. Yeah, he's held on like irrespective of the tech boom and then, you know, it being flat for 16 years, he's still the largest shareholder. So, you know, I kind of like that whole thing. You know, he's not thinking about the stock again. It's more about what the company's doing. So. Right. Yeah, even though I think yeah, it went nowhere in his tenure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think Frank. Um, I was just going to was... go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I was just going to say before, sorry, this lag's a bit tricky, isn't it, with a couple of second lag between us all. Um, I was just going to say, Frank had a good comment before that um, said, I'm a, I'm a notorious Tesla hater, but if they crash hard, I might become Elon's biggest fanboy, which is, I guess, it, it's equipped to, like, price matters. And if the price for Tesla gets low enough, we'll probably all flip to the other side, right? I love Elon. Uh, like, how do, how do you not love the guy? Like, he's, he's awesome. But yeah, the stock price, it's ridiculous. Um, and a risk adjusted basis, it could easily go up. But like, there's a big chance it could go down too, um, just because of how expensive it's gotten. Um, but yeah, I, I personally love Tesla as a business, and they're doing amazing things. And, and Elon's a great company leader. And a total weirdo, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean that the stock's worth it. There's lots of other things that go into it. So, guys, I just looked up Microsoft since 2001. Fifteen percent compound annual growth rate. So, even with that 15 years of stagnation, because of how it's done in the last six years, I mean, it's it's a solid investment over the last two decades. You so, just had to stomach no returns for 15 years, yep, <laughs> which yep. that's the hard part. That's right. Yeah, you you wouldn't want to be the guy that you know has gone through fifteen years of pain and finally gives up at that point, would you? <laughs> but that isn't that how the stock market works. A lot Some of the cost time. fallacy <laughs> for the win. Yeah. 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 Um, Should we jump into some questions over here? That's I'm, quite a few. I'm trying to. Uh, Frank says KPG is his right. best idea, and I do. Does wanna, anyone know about KPG? Kiwi Property Group. Uh, in, 
No, it's no, no, that's uh, no, <laughs> Kelly Partners. Oh, so, yeah, my bad. Yeah. Uh, so they keep buying back the stock. I think he's mentioned the entire thesis somewhere. In the oh, point. it's it's a cannibal, is it? Hmm. Yeah. I've I've read a couple of the write ups, so I can give you my um my rough uh, understanding of what's going on with KPG. Great. So. Yeah. And then Frank can tell me where I got it wrong and stuff later, I suppose. So um, basically, KPG is an accounting company, and mm -hmm. they've basically been a serial acquirer of other small accounting firms. And um, I guess they're in sort of a non grind So this is an Australian business on the ASX. So if you search kpg.ax stock, it should come up, Jack, if you're hunting Yeah, I got it. it. Um, so yeah, they're, they're managed by, uh, I think it's Brett Kelly, which is where the name comes from. Um, and he's like a super Warren Buffett nerd. So he talks about, you know, the intrinsic value of KPG on his calls and I'd buy back stock, you know, at, at a certain discount to intrinsic value and all the stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, and they're basically acquiring accounting businesses and centralizing a lot of their admin to try and, you know, increase their efficiency to have more billable hours and, and so on. And um, they've had a pretty good runway of something like, Frank can correct me in the comments here, but something like 30% compounded growth for the last decade or so um and he thinks they've got a pretty long runway to continue doing that essentially that that's basically the thesis um for for kpg i see brett kelly owns over half of the outstanding shares and it's only a 74 million market cap company yeah, very small cap company, and um, I think Brett Kelly's also written a few books and has a podcast on, oh, there you go, 34% growth since 2007, Frank saying. Awesome. Um, yeah, and also has a podcast where he talks about, um, you know, his thoughts on growing businesses and that sort of thing too. So, yeah, definitely strong kind of founder-owned thing. The I guess the big question is just how long is that growth runway, which I think um, Frank's also done some pretty good work on, and he's convinced it's quite a long runway still uh, to go. So, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Awesome. I think it's Frank's largest holding, isn't it? I believe so. Isn't I think it? he's had about a double in it, though, so it may have grown to that. Yeah, what was your percentage at cost, Frank? Yeah. Give him a second. Oh, there you go. That. Yeah. Yeah, that's the mm. other thing. So Frank, Frank's just put a comment, acquires businesses at four times EBITDA. So mm. yeah, the, there's, um, oh, I'm completely forgetting the, I'm com completely blanking on the name of the company here, but there's another business, 35% oh, yeah, of the portfolio. There's another business in the States which kind of does something similar, not with accounting firms, but they acquire, um, I think software, yeah, I've, I've, I'll have the example wrong, but the idea is they're acquiring businesses privately for four times whatever earnings proxy you want to use, and then they're getting valued at the time when I looked at it last year at like forty times earnings in the market. So they're almost like arbitraging like ten x this this private market, and they're just like running this over and over again and, and continuing to do really well. So I think there's an element of that potentially with KPG as well. But the other thing KPG are doing are actually. Uh, like I say, centralizing like some of the admin of the business and actually improving the EBIT or the earnings or whatever of what you want to call it of those companies. So they're kind of getting like a a, a two prong boost. They're getting that multiple expansion from the public market versus the private market, but they're also growing the earnings of each of those individual businesses that they're acquiring, and that's um, yeah makes some fairly exponential growth uh, tend to happen as well. So. Why don't we uh, go ahead and get into some questions since we're at about the 40 minute mark. Um, someone mentioned heritage growth properties, and I know that's been a hot topic in the value investing world. I'm personally not invested. Um, but I believe all three of you are, or at least have been invested in heritage. Um, so why don't we talk? Yep. Uh, the question from Jeremy here was heritage growth properties conviction the same. So has anything changed there? I bought more. Who's going to volunteer for 17. that one? Uh, what price did you buy more, Karan? The 17 ish. Okay. 17 points. It's about what it's at so, now, yeah? Maybe 18? Yeah, yeah. Recent. Like around two or three weeks back. You got to place all that GameStop money somewhere. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, Karan got into GameStop way before all the stuff happened with it and made many times his money in it. So. Um, 
that that worked out extremely I did okay. well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's forgettable. <laughs> yeah. Karan is tuning in from a private island right now. <laughs> um, that he owns. <laughs> that he owns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, so Ashad Ashad investing will be from our jet. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, SRG for me. I haven't made any changes. I bought the. Uh, I bought most of my position probably like a week after we did our live stream, whenever that was, Brad. So, I haven't bought or sold a thing in SRG since then. Um, uh, yeah, I guess they've had a management change since then. So that was a moderate red, red flag for me at the time. But I, I guess I can see why the previous CEO left. He went to a larger real estate investment trust business so you know good on them for doing that and i think the thesis still remains the same for me probably the so probably the only thing that did change in terms of how i think about the that entity is uh guy spear did a, a presentation with someone MLI. mli was it mli mm -hmm. best in, yeah so he changed my thinking on this a little bit and i don't know if you've done any work on on what guy spear said Brad or Quran, but he basically said that he thinks most of the value will get created from a handful of properties within SRG. So the only thing I've sort of changed mentally with that position is I'm probably thinking uh, about more of those properties effectively as cash to fund some of the core developments that they're doing. So some of the things that I know concern a lot of people is that SRG continue to sell off properties, you know, seemingly indefinitely, but I think they're essentially using that capital to fund projects where they think they can get better returns um so that's an idea that i that i've had but i'd say my conviction is still the same as when i first bought it i don't know why that scares people like if a, if they're able to have assets that they can sell and fund that i don't know well why there's a big difference between yeah. the mindset of all right they keep selling off these properties because they need cash versus mm. all right the plan going in is to sell off all but a handful of properties yeah. right that that's a, a difference in mindset like getting it yeah, i knew agreed. they would sell at least half of it like guy spear said it was around 70 80 percent right tom uh i don't know actually uh said, i thought like, the way he worded it was majority. yeah i think that's prop yeah you, uh, i can't recall but you that sounds about what my interpretation was yeah Frank's got the a value question. would come from like a very small bunch of the properties at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frank's got a semi-related yep. question here. With real estate prices going through the roof, possible bubble, does the macro consideration affect your conviction at all? And I guess that would really go for any REIT or, or real estate stock. Yeah, I can take a first crack at this if you like. Um, the short answer is no. Uh, the slightly longer answer is I see it as a potential uh not necessarily a, a property bubble or real estate bubble but i see a potential inflation hedge if something crazy does actually happen in that business obviously srg does have quite a lot of debt so um that could get inflated away if if property prices real estate prices keep going up and we do see some inflation but outside of that uh, it's not it's not like a it's not an idea that changes my thesis and in, in any way it's just something that i kind of ponder every now and then so what I, do you guys I, think i think about it a little bit especially with retail um retail is just in such a brutal position right now and, and it's been on a decline for a while and i know srg is trying to move away from retail and in and, and retrofitting their their new properties or their current properties um it's just an it's an additional layer of risk but then again it it all that really comes down to is if you can get it at a really good buy price that eliminates or at least mitigates a lot of that risk that if retail falls off the face of the earth, um, even more than it already has, um, then if you got it at a great buy price anyways, you should be insulated somewhat. So uh, that, that kind of, that's kind of the case with any um, sort of macroeconomic factor. I was actually talking with this uh, um, spoiler alert. I'll be on Tom's podcast uh, coming out soon. And we just talked about that a bit um, right before we jumped on this call. Um, it's like the real insulating factor for any sort of macro macroeconomic thing is getting something at a really good buy price. That goes for any asset, whether it be stocks, real estate. Um, if you can get something at a discount to what you think it's actually worth, 
if what it's actually worth actually falls as well, then you're insulated. So that's kind of a yeah. tangent, but yeah, the the only exception to that being um, as long as it doesn't eventually go to zero. Like if you can buy something at ten today and five. <laughs> In a couple of months, it's not necessarily better if it ends up at zero. But assuming that's not happening, right. uh, I completely agree. That is that is a given. I should have clarified. <laughs> well, this sounds like a nice segue into talking a little bit about Alibaba uh, and what Munger said about Alibaba in terms of seeing it as a cash alternative. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on on that? I know a few of you have made videos about it. I would call BS on that statement from Charlie oh, Munger. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't buy stocks just because they're a cash that's, alternative. That's right. He's what, trying what to keep the uh, the regulators at bay. Is that what it is, Tom? Uh, well, I don't know. What, what regulators does he have to keep at bay? Well, it sounds like there was talk about, what did I read? That, um, you know, the way Daily Journal is treated by the mm -hmm. SEC. Um, whether it's, yeah, there was something around needing to have a certain amount in cash equivalents. Um, oh, okay. Did you guys, did you guys look into that at all? Karan, Jack? I, had, I hadn't heard that. Okay. Uh, first I've heard. Okay. So you don't, wh why would he say that? Why would he say that, Tom? Do you have any sense? Uh, I don't know exactly. My, my guess would be Munga has always just, um, kind of tried to give people really low expectations of what he's doing <laughs> and, and he's, true. and he's that's just true. trying to do that. Yeah. Like he said it forever at Berkshire that, you know, he wouldn't buy at today's prices and, you know, we won't do as well as we have in the past, but we might do all right kind that's of thing. True. And then they've gone on to do spectacularly. So I, I think he's just trying to, uh, you know, keep, stop, stop so many people paying attention to what he's doing. Like he's never going to come out and say, I think Alibaba is going to do, 30% a year, just like my Costco investment for the next 20 years or anything like that. So <laughs> I, I think he's inverted that statement of what he definitely can't say because he's always inverting and he's said, ah, it's just a cash alternative. That's well said. And, and, and related to Berkshire, um, Jesse here is asking if we think that Buffett will do a similar move into, uh, into Baba. I mean, I highly doubt he'd make it a huge portion of his portfolio or the Berkshire portfolio, but... Um, thoughts on Buffett potentially doing something similar? I I think um, I think if that was going to happen, probably Ted or Todd may have moved on it already. Like I because right. they, they've bought a small position in, in Amazon and I feel like they would be more open to purchasing Alibaba, but they haven't pulled the trigger. I, that doesn't stop Buffett from doing it, obviously, but I don't know if it's in his circle of confidence where you've got Munga obviously having dinner with Lee Lu every Tuesday, he was saying, you know, yeah. in a talk last week, I think that's a, a quite a different situation to what's happening with Buffett. But um, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think Buffett's going to make a move in Japan. It's not going to be Baba. Japan. Recently. Yeah, he's raised another 1.5 billion, I think, in bonds, through yen bonds. Yeah, yeah so interesting. That's where he's going to go At next, yeah. Yeah, at like zero percent or something again, or just yeah. about. <laughs> he could Crazy. raise negative. He could raise like negative interest rate ah. debt. <laughs> yeah. This mon what a position yeah. to be in. Yeah. Per, per this monetary environment, uh, do you believe cash is trash? As Ray Dalio said, uh, this is coming from Mina or Mina. Um, apologize for saying that incorrectly. Uh, if so, how are you supposed to buy? How are you supposed to buy at bargain during corrections if you go all in now because? You're trying to keep cash off your off your balance sheet, if you want to call it that. Um, I, I can speak to this a little bit. Um, I'll go next. I, I definitely I definitely think cash is trash in general. However, um, you know maybe maybe it's not okay. I take that back. It's not totally trash. Having liquidity in general, whether it's cash or through debt or something, is useful in any sort of correction or or if there's a dip or there's some opportunity you want to jump on. I think being liquid is very important. Whether your liquidity comes from cash or something else, that, that's 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 where you have to make the determination. Um, I prefer to stay more invested than not, um, and then if I find a better opportunity, I will sell out of something else and then go that way, or I'll pull out debt from per, 
uh, potentially a piece of real estate or even margin if it's really that extreme. But I, I highly doubt I would do margin on a, on a stock investment. But for myself being in real estate, um, it, there's so much leverage in the system anyways. It's encouraged so much. Uh, if I can get cheap debt from something like real estate, I'm not going to keep cash. I'm, I'm just going to use it to buy more real estate and then take advantage of that super cheap debt um, more often than not. Not that I'm not going to have reserves and have cash available in an emergency. I'm not saying that, but uh, I would lean towards staying closer to fully invested than not. Yeah, to me, the cash is trash thing is just, you know, Ray is a student of long term cycles in markets, and he sees high likelihood that the uh, that the devaluation of the dollar is going to accelerate. Um, and so, you know, cash is, is a risky asset uh, as it's losing 3% even more year after year. Um, so one way to play that is to buy kind of upside without downside opportunities, heads I win, tails I don't lose much until you can find these bigger bargains uh, in corrections. Um, that's, that's one way to play it without having to hold cash. Yeah. I know what sort Greg, of examples are you thinking? Well, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, I was doing some stuff in SPACs where they were close to NAV. And so you have upside with fairly limited downside. Um, you could buy a cash alternative like Alibaba. <laughs> <laughs> Even like Equity Commonwealth is pretty much yeah. Equity example. Commonwealth is a great downside. example. Yeah, it, I, I was about to say the same, Karan. It, equity Commonwealth is like majority cash on its balance sheet, has a couple properties, and uh, when I made my purchase in Equity Commonwealth, the properties, uh, the company was trading at cash value, even though it had properties on its balance sheet with no debt. So it just seemed like a pretty easy decision, but. In that sense, they're insulated. Yeah, the company has a lot of cash, but they do have some properties. And if they find an opportunity to, before I do, they'll deploy it into something great. And then there you go. You, you compound there. Um, so it's, it's almost like, debt also. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And they could blow it up with, with leverage and at and incredible rates and at huge scale that you wouldn't be able to achieve on your own. So um, mm. yeah, I, Just I, a I, I concur with that sort of like, heads I win, tails I don't lose much sort of sort of thinking for cash alternatives. Yeah, just to, just to play devil's advocate, maybe I like that concept of like having essentially another store of cash where you can you can pull from that if you need to deploy it elsewhere. And you've got, you know, that upside downside mix. But I mean, is buying something like Equity Commonwealth, maybe that's a bad example, because I've got a little bit of real estate, but I, my understanding is it's almost all cash. Mm -hmm. Is that not the same thing as just holding cash yourself? Like, would you not be better off buying? I don't know, this is blasphemy coming from a Buffett nerd, but buying gold or silver or Bitcoin, bro? Or, you know? <laughs> I, I do have a fair amount of, of gold and commodity related holdings at, for that purpose. Um, it's really purely as like an inflation hedge um, while I wait for something else, um, ideally a real estate deal. Um, and, and even speaking on real estate, long term debt is the ultimate hedge, perhaps, uh, against inflation. If you can attach it to something like a, a piece of real estate, if inflation gets to be bad enough. Like uh, that's how Sam Zell, for example, I've done plenty of content on him. Uh, he, he made tons of money in the 70s when we had stagflation. He, he had enough liquidity where he could take over properties with pretty bad debt, but he had enough liquidity to take care of it, restructure, and then all of a sudden he's in an amazing position uh, because inflation's eating away at the value of the debt and his properties are going up with inflation too, and you get that that delta. Um, so that that's probably the best way, but you got to be very careful with debt, of course, because there's a cash flow issue if you, if you can't meet those payments. So you got to be careful. And then, of course, there's always the risk that you get a deflationary environment too. You never truly know what's going to happen. Equity mm. Commonwealth also keeps buying back stock, so mm. I mean, there's a bit of a return, but it's not it's not great. Yeah. But the fact is that management is is really good. At least they seem really good. So when the deal does happen, it's like we're going to be seeing nothing for a very long time, and then suddenly it's just going to yeah, like get a deal. It's going to be very creative and just I think it's going to do really well. It just it's that upside, Tom, to your question. It's like if they find a deal before you do, then you you get the benefit. That's kind of it. And if they don't, then you should be able to cash out without much harm. Um, uh, but however, 
SC358 says there's no substitute for cash, not gold, not Bitcoin. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying there. Um, yes, there's nothing as uh, quote unquote stable as cash. You have the inflation risk, of course, but uh, there's always a downside risk with any other investment, um, depending on what people do. So that is true. It's yeah. not the same risk profile with anything else. You know, I don't mm-hmm. think cash is trash because, at least in my experience, I've never been short on opportunities. I've always been short on cash. So <laughs> it's always a good idea to have cash around, at least in my opinion. Like, it's okay to have a cash drag, you know, if you're able to get like into a 5x investment or 10x, you know, something huge. Like, kind of like Mungo, you know, with the whole Tenneco investment and then Lilu's fund. I mean, he was in cash for most of that time. So. Mm. He did pretty well. <laughs> I think mm. that, I think that's. True. I, I love that Tenneco story. Yeah. You did. You covered it pretty well on your, on the channel. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good perspective on like the. Uh, there's there's always a lot of opportunities. The hard part's just finding them, of course. Um, at least compared to just holding cash and getting nothing or really like a negative real return. Um, it's it's a. Uh, uh, if you can find like an okay investment, that's probably better than cash, at least in my opinion. I, I'd, I, I think Frank asked earlier, uh, yeah, here you go. A liquid holding in a globally diversified ETF is probably the best option for cash alternative, in my opinion. So something with ideally not a ton of downside, but I mean, uh, we saw what happened to the global equities market with in March. You could have a flash crash for sure. Um, and if you're not ready to hold on, like that could, that could be painful. You need that cash. So, well, so let, let me play devil's advocate here, Jack. So you're saying mm-hmm. a mediocre opportunity might be better than cash. How does that measure up to our name here on the channel? Mm-hmm. Punch, <laughs> punch <laughs> card. <laughs> like like I, I, I'm not saying be reckless with it by any means, but um, like, for example, I just opened up a small position in Dropbox. I don't think it's a smoking investment, but I think it's really intriguing and has some good upside. And at current valuations, I think I could reasonably ex- reasonably expect something like a 10 or 12% return, uh, which would be pretty good. It's not amazing. And I'm not going to put all the chips in until I get a better deal. But just to kind of dip my toe in the water, it seemed worth it. So that's kind of what I'm thinking there. It's like if I can open up some okay positions in the meantime, um, while I wait for that real punch card investment where I, where I put a lot into it, that that's kind of my thinking with it. You like the whole SPAC idea that Brad was doing? Are you still in yeah. it or not as much? No, I've kind of backed off on it. Um, it was it was rewiring my brain a little bit in terms of you know shortening my time horizons, and I didn't like that it was pulling me away from focusing on the longer term opportunities. It's hard for me to compartmentalize. Like, okay, I'm going to spend a little time on SPACs, and then I'm going to spend on long term compounders. It just it wasn't working that well for me. Is someone asked, like the, go ahead. Oh yeah, I had a, yeah, question about like fill town selling options as a you know mm-hmm. cash alternative. Yeah, I, I was about thoughts on that. I was about to pull up oh, this question. Okay. Uh, I was going to say the same, like uh, cash secured puts um, mm-hmm. uh, or or or, the, or even covered calls if you already have um, an investment that that could be a great way to generate some extra income while you, while you wait for something or wait for a price target to be hit. Um, that's Maybe that's the best cash alternative. It's to buy derivatives <laughs> for your cash and, and then wait for the, the price target to actually be hit. Um, uh, obviously, you got to be careful with options. You make sure you know what you're doing. You got to know what you're doing. Yep. Yeah. And they are a little bit more complex to, to actually get over that learning curve. But um, it reminds me of the Robin Hooder who bought something on oil. Was it oil futures? And then it went negative and he was yeah, like I think it a, was mil- a million dollars in the hole or something. It was interactive brokers, I think. Uh, but, yeah. but similar with Robin Hood, the, the, the person who committed suicide when they saw the massive negative balance because uh, they didn't understand that um, uh, their one part of their debit spread, which is a fixed risk um, but in, by like definition, you're not, you can't lose more than you invest, but it showed a massive negative balance because it assigned one side of that spread. Um, and the other side hadn't been hadn't been cleared yet, hmm. so it looked like he had a huge negative balance. And he didn't know what was going on, and right. he, he unfortunately killed himself because he didn't understand that. And like, you really got to know what you're doing with options because it can be super scary when something like that happens, and you, and you don't know what to expect. So, for all any would be options traders out there, please be careful. Make sure you know what you're doing with any investing, I should say, because um, some crazy things can happen in options if if you do if you misclick. 
Mm. Has anyone used yeah, I, to generate? Yeah. I have a little bit. Um, actually, a lot on gold. Uh, I, I've been selling put spreads just like to try it out and learn the mechanics. Um, since I don't see gold value going down too much uh, with all the monetary, uh, um, with this monetary environment, it's not very much money though. I'm, we're talking about like maybe twenty bucks a week type of thing um, uh, of profit. But just learning the mechanics of how op, op, that sort of options trading strategy works, it, it's intriguing and uh, it's been good for learning how how that market functions. Mm. This is a this is a bit of an aside, but did we ever explain? What where punch card investing comes from? Yeah, I might as well. I wonder if we should cover that. That should be a good way to close this. Uh, why don't you go for it, Tom? I think you actually were the initial. We were trying to come up with a name for this monstrosity, and uh, and Tom came up uh, came up with punch card investing. So why don't you take it away? Yeah, sure. Uh, we it took us a while to figure out a name, and we're all <laughs> yeah. in different time zones. So I was I was waking up and looked at my phone, and it was like. <laughs> You have 50 new Instagram messages or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, punch, punch card investing basically comes from Warren Buffett for anyone that doesn't know. So um, he basically said that investors would be better off if they were given a punch card or 20 holes in it. And every time that they made an investment, that's punch out one of those holes. And that's all that you get in your entire investment lifetime. It's those 20 investments. So if if that's all you got, you would think about each of those individual uh, opportunities uh, very very long and hard, and then um, you know you'd you'd probably be likely to buy higher quality companies you can hold for a long period of time and not speculate and and short term things. And um, <clears throat> I also see we got a comment from SC three five eight about Norbert Lou. So Norbert Lou is um, I think Punch Card Capital is a hedge fund. He's um, mm -hmm. got a very concentrated portfolio and like three stocks in the US and a couple overseas ones for anyone that doesn't know. But that's where punch card investing comes from. I thought it was a good fit. Yeah, and to the time zones thing, we got five time zones we're working with. Like, So I'm in Chicago. Brad, you're in San Francisco. So already there's two hours between us. Tom, you're in New Zealand. Um, Frank's in Australia. And Karan's in the UAE. So we are all over the world here on punch card investing, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> and mm -hmm. this is like the one hour of, of, the, of the week that like could work. Runs up bright and early. It's like seven thirty his time right now. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then it's about bedtime for me pretty soon. So, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's great that we were able to do this. And again, um, if any of you guys haven't already subscribed, be sure to do that. Smash the like button as always, and, uh, and be sure to join our Discord as well, uh, where you can continue the conversation there. Can we do a round robin just to finish? I like this investing with Frank. Buy one, hold one, sell one. Berkshire, Amazon, Microsoft. Ooh. What do you guys think? Well, I already own some Berkshire. You so go I'll first while we think about it. <laughs> Should I go first? <laughs> okay, I am going to. Ah, this is tough. <laughs> Aren't um, buy and hold essentially the same thing in this situation? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm okay. I'll go. I'm going to okay. do them in the order that um, Frank actually presented them. So I'm going to yeah. buy Berkshire. Hold Amazon and sell Microsoft. Yeah, I, I think I'd concur there. Same I'm going to do the same. I'm a, I'm a shameless cloner, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well done. All right, that's a good way to wrap it up. Um, anyways, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And we will should be back here next week. Uh, we'll definitely post it uh, when we're ready to go, and we'll schedule it. And uh, hope to see you there. And hopefully we have Frank here next week. Yeah, Frank won't be on dad duties, and, and, and we'll uh, we'll get him on here. See you, everyone. See you guys. Sure. Okay. Good talking, yeah. guys.